what would be three great beginner plants to grow in a Martha tent and three like you mean next beginner level mushrooms? Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny clip for a videogram. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms, how they grow and what they do. Welcome to the Mushroom Mini Series on the Growing Joy Podcast. I'm Maria, and I'm obsessed with learning how mushrooms grow. And I'm Billy, Maria's husband, and I'm really excited to learn how we can use mushrooms to better our health and minds. Learning about mushrooms. Learning about mushrooms. Hello, my gorgeous plant friends. I hope you've had gorgeously planty weeks. By the time this episode airs, I will, fingers crossed, have planted up my entire grow bag garden that I'm doing on my balcony this year. I've already pre-ordered all my plants from Territorial Seed Company. They'll be arriving on my doorstep in late May when I get back. I'm spending May in Florida for my little sister's wedding, and I'm in this moment, as I'm recording the episode, very excited to get down there and then to come back and get fully in the growing season. I live in a microclimate in the Catskills of New York where our frost date is like late May, but we're encouraged not to plant until June 1st because it's just extra cold (laughs) where I live and it's super annoying. So I'm excited that we're in the throes of June now and growing. Anyway, I hope that you are also in a beautiful growing season. I'm so excited about today's episode. It's episode three of our four-part mushroom mini-series with North Spore. But before that, I wanted to give a quick shout out to a couple of our listeners, Victoria H., Gretchen P., Allison K., and Diane K. Welcome! They're some of the newest members of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform. For those of you that don't know, I have an app and a platform. You can access it via computer or iOS and Android app. And it's a, I call it the kindest and plantiest corner of the internet. It's a little space for our listeners all over the world to get together, swap stories, swap tips. The theme of this app, the theme of the Growing Joy Garden Society is make new plant friends, propagate plant care knowledge, and grow some joy. It's also an amazing way to support the show. We've closed our Patreon down, so if you want to support the show and help me support the team of contractors that we have, joining that community is an amazing option. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to learn more and sign up. Okay, this episode of the Mushroom Mini Series, it's probably the one you've been waiting for, How to Grow Mushrooms Indoors. If you haven't listened to the other two parts, I highly recommend you scrolling back in the feed and listening. Episode one, we discuss the world of the fungi kingdom, what mushrooms are, how they grow, how they can benefit humans. Episode two, we very interestingly discussed how we can grow mushrooms outdoors in our gardens next to the edible plants and flowers that we love so much. That was a mind-blowing episode. Today, we dive into the process of growing mushrooms with no outdoor space necessary. You can literally be harvesting homegrown mushrooms to enjoy for that dinner that you're cooking that night with a tiny footprint in your kitchen, or you can go ham and set up a mushroom grow tent in your home that you'll learn more about, very similar to the indoor greenhouses that we set up and use to cultivate our houseplants. Billy and I have had so much fun putting this mini series together. Personally, for me, it's been such a joy and honor, honestly, to be joined by my husband as a co-host. It's so fun doing these conversations with Billy, and it's fun growing with him together as a plant or mushroom parent. We jokingly refer to ourselves as mushroom farmers now. And we're just so lucky that Louis from North Spore Mushrooms shows up for us every interview that he's giving us, like four separate hours of his time to gift this community with all of this incredible mushroom knowledge. Today's episode we go deep and we cover a lot of ground. And if just so you know, if this conversation inspires you and you want to grab yourself a grow kit or you want to maybe try growing, North Spore does have everything you could ever need to grow mushrooms. And they've offered our community 10% off with the code GROWINGJOY at checkout. Billy and I actually do the normal check-in that we do before the interview on the interview with Louie because we wanted to check in with him. So let's dive right into the conversation. Welcome back, Louie. Great to be back. Thank you. Our favorite podcast so guest. So good to see you. <laughs> we love talking to you. Billy and I have to like brag to you a little bit at the beginning of this episode because we are officially mushroom farmers. We've grown two flushes of oyster mushrooms in our North Spore Grow Kit. Successful mushroom farmers. Hey, congratulations. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's really exciting to see them change so quickly, huh? It's wild. It's wild. It's been so fun. I'm 
when I was taking care of it, I was like, this is the best houseplant ever. I can water it every day. I can engage with it every day. It's so fun to take care of. I'm constantly stressed about overwatering all of my houseplants. But with that little mister, you can miss that puppy all day long, especially in our dry house, and never worry about it getting overwatered. It's incredible. And then you get to eat it at the end, which is my favorite part. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. My brother-in-law was just in town with his wife, and we ate a bunch of pink oysters that I grew off a block that was sitting in my kitchen. And they were really stoked about it. You're absolutely right about the misting. You can miss those and should as often as possible, and you're not going to overdo it. Yeah. Billy, I want to ask you, like, what was your experience? How do you feel now that you're a mushroom farmer? Proud, excited, like it's a brave new world. No, I mean, honestly, it really was an awesome experience. I was excited from the jump because I was already thinking about how I was going to cook the mushrooms at the very end. And that's typically how I'm focused. I'm, I'm pretty goal oriented. So for me, it was about the harvesting and the cooking. And what struck me was I would come in throughout the process and be taken aback by how much they had grown, even in you know a half a day or, or overnight. And that was where I started to slow things down a little bit more and get a little bit more connected to the life cycle of the fruiting body and the mushrooms themselves and kind of be like amazed at all the different colors and just how strong they were. And then the coolest part for me was after we had that first harvest, the block looks a little barren, obviously, because you had all these mushrooms. And then nature soldiers on and we got another flush of mushrooms which was like you know it was like an unexpected extra present at christmas it was pretty cool yeah that is really really great and exactly what we hope a kit will do it's capable of three or even four harvests yeah. those flushes will keep coming they'll be diminished in size and really the limiting factor is moisture and so you can dunk your block and soak it for, you know, around an hour and really drain it well and perhaps get more mushrooms. Or you can even move things outside and bury the block at, under like just a, a little bit of leaves or mulch or soil and get more mushrooms that way too. It's good to know for Oh, that's two. cool. So we can like toss it in the forest after. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 And that's really where it wants to be. And so that way it'll be able to really, really absorb moisture better than it can in your home. Because at that point, Mr. just isn't going to do it. Yeah, totally. Okay. And for listeners, if you don't know what we're talking about, North Spore, the company that Louis works for, makes these really beautifully designed grow kits where literally all you do is open it and spritz it with water and mushrooms grow. So today's episode is all about celebrating growing mushrooms indoors. And if you want the easiest, lowest level entry moment, these grow kits are definitely your option. I found out about North Spore because we were at a grocery store in a local town near us and I saw this like beautiful grow kit of blue oyster mushrooms. If you remember from our last conversation, I bought the kit for a white elephant and then stole it back because I wanted to grow the mushrooms myself. And I also got matching mushroom socks that I wear all the time. <laughs> but anyway, so I just figured we had to have this check-in with you, Louie, because we're so stoked to finally Episode three, I think people have been waiting for this episode about how to grow mushrooms indoors. I'd love to kind of frame the conversation and ask you, I think when people think about growing mushrooms indoors, what I've noticed, I've actually been really surprised when I tell people that I'm doing this mushroom mini series with you, that people immediately go to magic mushrooms. They immediately go to psilocybin. I feel like people don't even really understand that you can grow functional mushrooms. And if you're growing mushrooms indoors, you're growing magic mushrooms and that's it. And I think that's the association. Like, what do you think about that? Working for a company that celebrates other mushrooms beyond psilocybin. Wow. It has taken a long time. And I don't know if we'll ever be, be past that stereotype. Even at the farmer's market, when I was very clearly selling food, people came up every single market asking about magic mushrooms and inquiring about that and making dumb jokes about that. And you know, the truth is they are amazing and there is a reason that people are asking about it and it's a remarkable aspect of the fungal kingdom and we have a, a really special relationship with magic mushrooms and it's really too bad that they got maligned legally so much, but they grow naturally outside all the time. They're very common. The species Psilocybe cubensis that is found all over the world, growing on manure is, it's not something sort of like weed that can be stopped. And so 
when people seek that out and they've developed really, really cool ways to grow those mushrooms. And by experimenting and working on low tech ways, like in your dorm room under a bed or something to grow these psychedelic mushrooms, really a lot of these folks doing that were advancing mycology and mushroom cultivation generally. And so, you know, those people, they really pioneered. A lot of it was done in the 60s and unsurprisingly and 70s. They really pioneered the monotub. And now the monotub is a whole different beast and the techniques have been refined and there's a lot of other uses for it. Yeah, it's very interesting. It reminds me of, you know, when you look at houseplant trends and gardening trends, but more indoor growing, when you look at houseplant trends, the real trendsetters are actually going to the cannabis conferences because cannabis has been the indoor growing operation that has really moved that technology forward, like with grow lights and with hydroponics. Cannabis, that industry is what's kind of set the example for all of us to kind of follow. And it's interesting that you're saying it's kind of the same with psilocybin, that, you know, the illegal stuff is actually ironically like what pushes it forward. We're going to give a disclaimer at the top of this episode. We're not telling you to grow mushrooms if they're not legal in your home, right? Where this episode is not geared around psilocybin. This episode is geared around these gorgeous functional mushrooms that you can grow indoor legally in most places, wherever you live, at least where, at least if you're in the States. Did I cover that disclaimer well? Louis, did I forget anything? No, I think that that's the point. We're going to talk about these delicious and functional varieties, but it's sort of impossible to do that yeah. without a nod to the history and the original use for some of these. Yeah, a reverent nod, it's yes. A, it's a tip of the hat because, I mean, these are pioneers, right? And it sounds like what you guys are doing is having learned from a lot of the pioneers that came before and advancing the technology further. And now we get to benefit as consumers and as people who are excited about mycology to learn about the next step. Because I have to say too, we didn't talk about this in our check-in, but Billy and I are on the lion's mane oh, yeah. train so hard. We are believers in functional mushrooms, okay? We've been taking your lion's mane extract every day. And I'll speak personally, I've noticed a tremendous difference in my focus and my ability to get work done when I take it and when I don't. So, you know, the more we interview you, the more we engage with growing mushrooms, ingesting mushrooms ourselves, functional mushrooms, non-magic mushrooms, the more I'm really believing in the power of mushrooms and fungi and the wide variety. Did yeah. you want to say something? No, I mean, lion's mane has legitimately changed quite a few things for me. I mean, I, the way that I've always described lion's mane since I started it a month ago, is that my brain? Two months. It's yeah, been two, two months. Yeah, two yeah. months. My brain now feels like when I felt when I was in third grade and I was doing a book report and I was really excited about the book and I knew absolutely everything and I could talk about it for hours and hours. It was easier for me to find the words that I was looking for, and it was easier for me to string together complex thoughts and to be able to have conversations a little bit more simply. And then you know, math got easier for me as well because I. You know, I struggle like everybody does with focusing on complex problems for long periods of time. And I've noticed that that has gotten significantly better. So it's been a huge quality of life change for me. And I'm just so thankful. And it's now a regular part of my supplement stack. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, I would challenge anybody now. This may sound like a bold statement, but I would challenge anybody to, from a starting point of no mushrooms, to start taking a 500 milligram capsule or tinctures, or perhaps eating mushrooms and doing that as a habit every day, whether it's lion's mane or cordyceps or reishi or chaga, but particularly, you know, like you said, lion's mane. If after about a month you have not noticed something, I'd be really surprised. I know I have. It takes about that time ish, and you really will notice a difference in your life, especially if you have some sort of a benchmark test to really see a change. Yeah. I love it. So perfect segue to the topic of today's episode, how to grow mushrooms indoors, because I want to grow lion's mane so that I can have a lion's mane steak with my eggs every morning. <laughs> I want to, I'm like enough of the tincture. I want to be eating the actual mushroom every day and also the reishis. So let's talk about the different methods of growing indoors and the differences. And then maybe I can pick your brain about each of them separately. Wonderful. Starting off, we have to talk about the spray and grow kits, which I believe is what you guys had. And so the spray and grow kits are four pounds. There are four varieties, lion's mane, pink oyster, golden oyster, blue oyster, 
pink oyster, golden oyster, blue oyster, and lion's mane. Right. All of those are the four. And those four are really, really resilient, tough, fast growing, adaptable. They are the perfect beginner species. And they can grow in a room that doesn't have super specialized environment. You do want to supplement with the misting, right? And they can grow very well that way. That's where everybody should start. If you have no experience growing mushrooms at all, and you just need to get acquainted with the organisms and kind of understand their timeline and their needs, that's where you should start. It's going to show you that mushrooms need a high level of humidity. They need really good airflow. They need ambient light, not to be shut in a completely dark compartment. And they need some cleanliness too. They don't want to be in a filthy environment either. And from there, you can move to more advanced methods, right? Even with just a spray and grow kit, you can create a small humidity chamber very, very easily. You can take a plastic bag and maybe some chopsticks and stick them out of the box and tent the plastic bag over the box and poke a bunch of holes in the bag, a bunch. And then when you spray, you're going to spray all over the, the front of the box, but also all over the inside of the bag. And that's going to hold in more humidity and really help out your mushrooms. What we've found over time, I've definitely seen this with the spray and grow kits, is pink oyster, golden oyster, blue oyster, they are definitely the most resilient. Lion's mane? Lion's mane doesn't always form perfectly if it doesn't have nice, consistent humidity. It'll still grow and be delicious, but it might not form those spines, those hairs, really nicely if it has this crazy fluctuation in humidity is what we found. So that's a really nice little way to step up your game and feel like you've created a better environment for it. It's the entry drug. It's <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't use the word drug after we just talked about magic mushrooms. It's the gateway. It's the thing that's going to wet your palate to get you really excited. And I think that's exactly where Billy and I are. We used a kit. We're like, oh my God, we want to 10X this and have enough sustainable mushrooms growing so that we can always be harvesting and eating. So, you know, you talked about humidity, ambient light, and then obviously a growing medium. So... Where shall we go from here? Shall we move on to what I think is the more accessible variety option, the Martha tent? Yeah. So once you sort of said to yourself, all right, all right, I get it. These kits are great, but I'm ready for the next thing. I want to explore more fungal frontiers. You can look into the rest of our grow kits. There are 13 fruiting block varieties that we offer. There are other species out there too that are offered in various places as grow kits, but there's a lot of diversity there within those 13 species. And the fruiting blocks are different in that they're a pound heavier and they don't come with the box and the little sprayer. At that point, you are expected to be able to follow the directions and which may be more advanced and differentiated and get your own system in place. And that now brings us to the boom room. The boom room is that system. It is a basically a greenhouse with a humidifier and a fan that allows you to regulate the humidity and fresh air within your system. It also connects to a humidity controller so you can define that range and it'll kick on the humidifier when needed. Yeah, so the boom room and the Martha temp. The Martha temp is the grow method that we're talking about. The boom room is the North Spore product of the Martha tent, right? That's correct. <laughs> Thank you to this episode's sponsor, Soltech. Soltech, the maker of the premium grow lights that I am obsessed with. If you've been a longtime listener of the show, you know about my love affair with Soltech. They used to be called Soltech Solutions. They make the full spectrum plant lights that have illuminated my home and kept my plants healthy for many, many years. If you haven't heard about them already, Soltech provides a stylish solution to give your plants all the necessary photosynthetic rays they need to thrive. From succulents to ferns, their lights are perfect for upgrading your plant's environment and adding a touch of spring to any room. Their warm white light is ideal for growing houseplants, and they offer a variety of options, including bulbs, track lights, and their most popular American-built aspect pendant light. Let me tell you, I got one aspect pendant light in my 500-square-foot apartment in New York City, and I liked it so much, I got two more. I have three aspects in total. 
And then I also use their Vita grow bulb. It's a grow bulb that they have that you can literally screw into any desk or floor lamp. It's amazing. But don't just take my word for it, even though I have like five Soltech lights in my home that I've been using for years. They have thousands of five-star reviews on their products. These grow lights truly do speak for themselves, and they have a 90-day money-back guarantee, so you can purchase with confidence. So visit Soltech today and use the code BLOOM15 for 15% off your purchase. So once again, that's soltech.com. And use the code BLOOM15 for 15% off your purchase. These are premium grow lights, so that 15% is going to really help. Give your beautiful plants the lighting that they deserve and upgrade your plant game with Soltech. Once again, that's Soltech.com, code BLOOM15, BLOOM15 at checkout. Soltech.com, BLOOM15 at checkout. We are in wedding season, plant friends, and I can't think of a more unique and delightful wedding, birthday, or anniversary gift than a Wind River wind chime. Wind River chimes will deliver the most magical, most thoughtful, and personalized gift straight to your door. Wind River Chimes creates premium, handcrafted, and hand-tuned wind chimes, which are designed for exceptional precision and lasting beauty. For over 35 years, Wind River Chimes has been passionately pursuing harmony by delivering wind chimes that help create a peaceful, soothing, and restful environment. We have had two of their chimes on either side of our house for the last four months, and I have to tell you, plant friends, waking up to the sound of the chimes from my bedroom window singing to me has honestly made my house feel like a spa. I love the wind chime that's outside of my office. It sings in the wind throughout the day, and it's a reminder to just drop in and be present. I'm obsessed, and I bet whoever you gift one to would be obsessed as well. A Wind River Chime is the perfect gift because every time the recipient hears the gorgeous chime singing in the wind, they're going to think of you and be gifted a moment of calm. Plus, if you use the code GROWINGJOY at checkout, you'll get a free engraving on any engravable wind chime, so you can personalize the wind chime with a name, an anniversary date, or a special message. Go listen to all the different options they have on their website. Head to windriverchimes.com to listen to all of the melodious options and use the code GROWINGJOY at windriverchimes.com for a free engraving to add a special element to your gift. Once again, that's windriverchimes.com with code GROWINGJOY. So just to kind of go back without, like, in a super general sense, a Martha tent is basically a grow tent, like the grow tents that a lot of us have for our more high humidity plants. That's kind of rigged up with a couple of things to ensure good airflow. So there's a vent. You have a great video on your website about how to set one up, but there's a vent and also a humidifier. And the thing that I find really interesting about a Martha tent is as a houseplant parent, I have a humidifier and I have a grow tent already. So I'm kind of like, I wonder if I could like jerry rig my own Martha tent setup and then get your fruiting blocks because I don't want to do the work over there to make my own and then have a setup. So did I miss anything? It's a fan with a vent, a humidifier, and then the, the hu- is it a hygrometer or it's the thing that manages the humidifier that keeps it at a certain amount of humidity, right? It's more like a humidistat. And so- Yeah, that's basically correct. You can rig this up yourself. And actually, it's better to have your humidifier externally and piped in. And we do recommend that negative pressure system instead of positive pressure. We get a lot of people reaching out about this. They say, why do you have a negative pressure system? Meaning it's pulling air in from the bottom and pushing air out the top. Or you could have it the opposite. It could be pulling air in the top and pushing it out the bottom but that's a negative pressure system instead of pulling in filtered air and kind of puffing the whole tent out and being kind of like airtight. And that's a positive pressure system. And that would like push dirty particles away. That's a much harder thing to control. And if you have a lot of spores being made in your tent, you might not necessarily want them just being blown out all over your space. The negative pressure system allows you to vent those spores and direct them away, which is really nice. So with a Martha tent, you should have that vent that is kind of connected to or placed up against a window so it can blow those spores outside? That's the ideal situation, yeah. You can have a piece of foam in your window and have a hole cut out for a vent and for ducting to go right out. And the ducting fits right over inline fans. And our boom room has one that fits perfectly on ducting. That is, I want to say it's six inch ducting, four inch or six inch. 
And that way, all that humidity and all the spores are headed outside. But if you don't have the ability to vent outside, you could also vent towards a standing air purifier. And if you're only doing a couple blocks, it's just really not that much of a concern. One other thing I'll add on to that is you do want to have a pre-filter on the inside, which will prevent excessive buildup of spores on your fan. And we'll take a lot of the spores out of the air. Not all of them, but we'll take a lot of it out of the air. Quick question here. With it's such a humid environment, obviously mold is a concern. So how do you avoid mold with a Martha tent? Is that because of the negative pressure system? Well, mold is definitely always a concern. So you're going to need to maintain this thing. You're going to need to clean it probably once a week. You're going to need to make sure that your all of the components are as clean as you can get them. And it's hard to clean some of them. A fan, you know, you're just going to have to do your best to keep that as clean as possible. They can take a beating with high humidity and spores, but with regular cleaning of the whole thing, it's going to last longer, especially that humidifier. You don't want mold and bacterial buildup in the air that you are turning into mist and spreading everywhere. And that leads into the other consideration, which is contamination of your blocks. Mold is everywhere, guys. And these blocks, because they're fully colonized, they are much less susceptible to contamination. That's why we can do this. That's why you can stick them in this space that's not sterile at all and pull unsterile air in from below and have tons of success. The blocks are able to fight off invaders, but only to a point. If you have a super dirty space, they will mold faster. And at the end of the day, the mold is going to win no matter what. Like if you did a block for three, four crops, four flushes, right? At some point, mold is very likely to start to establish itself eventually. Mm. I feel like with houseplant people, we're cleaning our humidifiers once a week anyway. So I feel like just having that once a week maintenance seems really doable to me. What about yeah, I think that sanitation's important. I mean, obviously, I brewed for a long time, and sanitation's an important part of brewing. Like, you have to make sure that you don't have any variables that you're not accounting for. And you, really, it's you're just doing the best you can. But I, I do think that once a week for the yield that you can get in a Martha tent is well worth it. I mean, in my opinion, because I want to grow lots of mushrooms. <laughs> and if you, yeah, if you can't do a thorough clean, an entire breakdown and clean once a week, Clean the humidifier once a week and clean the rest of it at least once a month for sure. You're going to want to really – and clean that pre-filter once a week too. That pre-filter can just be washed out and reused for quite some time. And you'll see. You'll start to see those spores build up on a pre-filter. Mm. So I want to get into like what is in the fruiting block and different mushrooms to grow in a Martha tent. But before that, in terms of like – care. So we put our fruiting block in there. How high are we setting that humidistat to keep the humidity? And what are we doing to those fruiting blocks in order to get the yield? Is it kind of a set it and forget it? We've got to maintain the tent. But once we put those fruiting blocks correctly in the tent, they're going to do their thing? Or is there like a watering or a maintenance of the actual block? It is a set it and forget it system but you need to have dialed it in first. And so let's say your grow tent, if it is a boom room, it can fit about 10 blocks max pretty comfortably. You want space around the blocks. You don't want to crowd everything really in there, but about 10 blocks. And that's a lot of mushrooms, guys. If you had 10 blocks in there, you're going to need to dial things in and it's going to be specific to your environment, right? The temperature and the ambient humidity, it's all going to affect what your settings will be. And so you could have your fan on a super duper low setting and on all the time. And you're going to want your humidity range to be between 80 and 90% is really where you want it to be. 85% is really, really great for mushroom production for all of these species. And temperature is going to vary though. Like Namaco mushrooms, they grow very nicely at high humidity and a very low temperature in the 50s. But pink oyster might not love that so much. Pink oyster might want things a little warmer. 
And so pairing up the mushrooms and kind of finding the sweet spot, can they be grown together? Yeah, but you're gonna have to find that like that like slight overlap in the like low 60s. And actually most things will like it there. That's actually a good point. If I had to say one temperature that like would be like the best kind of for everything, it'd be like 60 to 65. Probably almost everything is gonna really like it there. And if it's too warm for that, then things like King Trumpet and Namako may have to wait until winter, right? And you can just switch your species out because there is not a temperature control. I like the seasonality of it. I think that if you wanted to follow the seasons when these mushrooms would grow naturally in nature and that temperature, that's pretty cool. I just had one quick question for a bit of clarification. When you say fruiting block, can you go into what makes up a fruiting block, all the different pieces of it? Because I know that that's almost like its own little colony, but what goes into making it? Sure. So it all starts with the bag which are really, really special. It's a polypropylene bag that can handle a real beating. It can be pressure cooked for hours and hours and hours at high temperatures and pressures. And it has a built-in little filter patch. And there's lots of different kinds of filter patches, but our most standard is a five micron filter patch. So it doesn't let much pass. And it can filter out contaminants while still allowing the organism to breathe, right? Because a mushrooms inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. And that mycelium in the bag still needs to breathe. So basically what's done is we take a proprietary mix, but there is a standard recipe known as the master's mix. And it's basically like a 50% more nutritious substrate, like soy hull and a 50% hardwood sawdust. That's kind of the standard beginner mix. And you would take that and you need to hydrate it to 50 to 60% hydration. And then you sterilize or pasteurize that very well, especially with the high nutrition content, it can contaminate more readily. So you need to pasteurize it very well. And at that point in a lab under a flow hood with HEPA filters, we put grain spawn, small amounts of grain spawn into those bags, seal them up. And they colonize. And then when they come to you, they're ready to be cut open and grow. I think we should take this minute to ask a re-clarification. I know you've said it on previous episodes, but spawn versus spores. Can you clarify the difference? Thank you for asking that question. This is one of those that makes me feel like such a like mushroom elitist or something sometimes. But I get it's like if somebody, you know, said never used the word seeds and always said roots to you or something. So yeah, it is very much that. Mycelium is what we are working with and mycelium on a substrate with the intention to inoculate something else is spawn. And spores are the tiny units analogous to seeds that are produced under the caps of mushrooms and in other shapes and ways. But they spores are very, very tiny, <laughs> very, 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 very tiny. And they, when they germinate, and we do use that term germinate, they then produce something called hyphae or hyphae. And then that, when they find the correct mating type, will produce a mycelium. And so most of what North Spore is doing is we have a strain we like, and we have its mycelium, and we are extrapolating that mycelium. We almost never work from spores because of that genetic variation that you can get. Just like with fruit production, when you have an apple orchard, you are not working from seeds. You're grafting because you want those honey crisp apples to con- be consistent. That's a really cool way to say that because so, you know, a spore would eventually in nature grow into a spawn of some kind or a mycelium network that could be used to spawn. But you guys have identified a strain you like, a genetic strain that you like, and you keep that mycelium alive and to build into spawn that you can then inoculate these bags with, and then you'll get fruiting bodies out of it. Do I have that right? Yes, that's exactly right. And based on the material that you put it on, it'll have kind of different strengths and uses, right? Like grain spawn itself, just pure grain, is not a good substrate to fruit off of, but it's fantastic for spreading. And then the woody substrate in a fruiting block is perfectly formulated for fruiting this wide variety that we have. That's awesome. This is blowing my mind a little bit. So just because I'm obviously thinking in plant parallels all the time throughout my whole life, if I have a plant that I really like, I can give it to you in two different ways. I can wait for the plant to flower and then harvest the seed and give it to you. Or I could take a division of that plant, take that plant, 
almost separate it, let that plant grow roots and give that to you. Is that kind of like what spawn is? Yes. It's like a division of the mycelium? The difference would be that you're giving what you would be giving, and actually it's sort of the same terminology in plants, would be a culture. You are giving a culture. And we often provide cultures in the form of agar plates or liquid culture. The difference with spawn, and I guess a bigger bag of soda spawn, would just be the amount and the ability for it to inoculate many different things if it's spawn, right? It's not sort of like a single cutting. That's one way to sort of look at it as amounts, but it's basically the same thing. That's like a mushy, it's not exact, but it's like a little bit, right? Yeah, because it's not plants. We're talking about mushrooms or plants is a little different. Okay, cool. Anyway, back to the Martha tent. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. So just to recap what we just talked about. So we're setting up our tent, whether it's, you know, a cobbled one together from a houseplant parent's corner of stuff that we have or a boom room, which is the North Spore kind of branded. We've got everything you want for a Martha tent set up and you don't have to question it option. We're getting it to 60 to 65 degrees. We're getting it to 80 to 85% humidity. And then we're once we've dialed it in, as you've referenced, once we've dialed in the conditions, then it's time to put the fruiting blocks in. You can buy a fruiting block, which is pre already inoculated and the mycelium is like ready. And basically you cut the block open, you expose it to air that's going to start growing because basically the fruiting block is what we did in the grow kit. It's just putting it in better conditions, right? Yeah, you're putting it in better conditions and the fruiting blocks just don't come in those pretty little boxes and they're a little larger. It, it's going to make more sense when you are scaling up your production and you don't need to buy 10 spraying grow kits and get 10 of those little sprayers. You're sort of taking these blocks in sort of their naked form and putting them into a grow space that they're going to really be happy in. Okay, so that's super helpful. And those fruiting blocks have the grain spawn, which we just discussed, and then that pasteurized substrate. Hey, I did wonder, how do you pasteurize something? You boil it? So we have giant autoclaves that we use for sterilization, and all our grain gets sterilized that way. And then we have other big steam tanks that are basically just big troughs that we've insulated and we hook those up to, we hook big hoses up to them that pump steam in and basically sterilize them over, I think we still do a double, basically what's a double pasteurization, which amounts to a sterilization over an extended period of time. And we have probes that we put throughout in the cook in different places in bags to make sure that our temperatures are reached for the times that we need them reached. Cool. What would be three great beginner mushrooms to start in a grow tent? If you're just moving to the grow tent, I mean, you can do any of those fruiting blocks. Really, one of them, reishi, can be grown right in the bag and like never really needs to go in any kind of tent, but it can and it will form better. But I would say that the three new ones that you should add to your repertoire, one of them is an old one. We're going to say lion's mane because it is so awesome. It's really going to enjoy it in there and form better than it ever did, you know, on your countertop. And so never discount that one, lion's mane. Number two, branching into something like chestnut. Chestnut is not a difficult mushroom to grow. It takes a little longer, but they are so beautiful and so delicious. So I would strongly recommend chestnut. And then trying something like Italian oyster or Black King oyster. So either of those are other oysters that are just going to be a little different from the oysters that you've done so far. And they're really also delicious and forgiving. My Italian wife is going to want Italian oyster. Yeah. That's for sure. And that's sure. definitely going to happen. So we'll have like his and hers because I'm going to eat all the lion's mane before she has a chance. No, I want my own lion's mane too. <laughs> Yeah, I like too this idea, and this is also why we grow our own food, right? You get portobello mushrooms at the grocery store. You go to the grocery store, and there's portobello mushrooms pre sliced or, you know, whole. If you're lucky, maybe there's a thing of shiitake, but it's $10 or $15 for one little box. Like the variety at the grocery store is so abysmal. Unless maybe you're at a Whole Foods, but we don't have a Whole Foods where we live. And the nutritional value of mushrooms is so high, it's like so annoying. 
So I love the idea of being able to just kind of grow the good stuff, just like I'm growing the tastiest, most abundant varieties of cherry tomatoes that you can't find in the garden center, you know? Right. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. So now when we start to talk about the economics of it, I want to mention two things. One is we do have, and this is, you know, another North Spore specific plug, is we do have something now called the Blocks Box, which is a subscription to get your fruiting blocks and save money on it that way. But you can also at this point, step up your game even more and utilize grain spawn. And you can use one bag of grain spawn to inoculate multiple buckets of straw and grow in buckets in your boom room or Martha. And that can be a really, really great way to do it, but it's going to require some other steps. We have an awesome walkthrough on it, but essentially you're going to take straw and you're going to pasteurize that straw. You can do it either chemically with agricultural lime raising that pH to about 12.5 during that soak, or you can do it with heat and steam and cook the straw. And then you're going to take that straw that's now cleaner and you're going to add oyster spawn to it, oyster grain spawn. This method really is best with the various oyster species. And you could pack the straw and the spawn together in perhaps two gallon buckets with nice quarter sized holes in them. And stick those buckets in your Martha and grow a lot of mushrooms. For one bag of spawn, you could make a bunch of buckets and fill up your Martha tent for sure. So that would be a really economical way to do it. Oh, I love that. Because I definitely want to try the bucket method we talked about in the last episode for growing outdoors. I want to try the bucket method, the laundry basket method on my balcony, filling it with straw. So maybe I'll do an experiment with a little bit of grain spawn in the grow tent too. I would if love we, that. If Billy lets me set up a Martha tent. Yeah. And one way to have it to make that work even better is when you make the buckets, cover the holes with filter tape or filter patches of some sort it'll reduce contamination rates and reduce moisture loss even more. And then once it's ready to grow, you take those off. Once you're at full colonization, which can happen in as little as like two weeks. Oh, wow. And once it's fully colonized, it's similar to what you said earlier with the fruiting blocks being protected from mold, right? Like once it's fully colonized and it's ready to fruit, that's the highest defense that that substrate's really going to have from mold and mildew and it's ready to roll, right? Totally correct. Okay, cool. That's exciting. Love it. Okay. And it's my understanding that you can grow a larger variety of mushrooms in a Martha tent versus the monotub, which is what we'll talk about next. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at the monotub, it's not as suitable for as many species because a lot of things just aren't going to 
really love that broad fruiting surface. The Martha also is all about controlling the environment, but minus the whole sterility thing, which is something that you have to keep in mind when you, it's very, very important when you begin your monotub journey. Okay. So let's begin our monotub journey together now. We've covered the Martha tent. For those that are interested in living their best lives with a monotub, which to me, from the research I've done, seems way more stressful <laughs> with all Super of this, varsity. St- <laughs> all this sterilization you have to do. Can you walk us through like high level what a monotub is, what you need in order to make a monotub successful? And maybe we should start with what you should try growing in a monotub. Sure. Let's start with what you can grow in a monotub. So as we alluded to in the beginning of the episode, the monotub was sort of developed for growing cubensis, for growing psychedelic mushrooms. And it's still fantastic at that and at growing other manure-based species. I've seen people grow things like bluet. I've seen people experiment with wine cap, which is more of an outdoor species. I've seen people experiment with almond agaricus and button mushrooms in monotubs. It works quite well with species like chestnut, namaco, and piapino as well. So those are really great things to consider. You can just buy prepared substrate and spawn and mix the two in the tub. You're going to want to clean your tub really well, and you're going to want to clean your space because as it colonizes, it needs to take over all of that space, all of the chunks of nutritious goodness. But there's mold everywhere, and that mold can get there first. And so you want your space to be as clean as possible when you combine that in the tub. And so at that point, you're sort of in in science mode. You want to spray everything down with 70% isopropyl alcohol all over the space. You don't want to have windows open and a lot of cross breeze. Maybe run an air purifier for a few hours in the room before you even start try and be as clean as possible. If you are growing other species and you don't want to go directly from spawn, you can get liquid culture syringes or spore syringes and inject directly into blank spawn bags. We have three pound injection port bags and you can inject in there, colonize it yourself, and then mix it with substrate. And it doesn't have to be a manure-based boomer bag substrate. Some A very common mix that people use is quar vermiculite and gypsum. CVG is a very common way. And you just do a high spawn rate to provide that nutrition. And that works with numerous species as well. Interesting. So it sounds like, I mean, I watched the video on your website because I had never really heard of this method before. And it's like a plastic tub. You've got to drill holes in it. And the sterilization, you really can't overemphasize how important sterilization is because when you're planting this thing up with the substrate, if there's just a little bit of another spore or mold that's in the air that then gets stuck in there, you're going to just get mold all over that. You've created the perfect environment for mold. And I don't want to, you know, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can have a high success rate without being sterile. What you want to do is practice aseptic technique. And by practicing aseptic technique, you're going to minimize that. One way that you can do that, and it's really cheap and low tech, is you can create what's called a SAB or still air box, S-A-B. And so still air box is literally just a big plastic tub turned upside down and you cut armholes into it. And when you do your work, that's all it is. And when you do your work in that, You're preventing any particles from raining down from the top or coming in from the sides, and you can really clean things up in there. It's just a much easier environment to control, and people find very high success rates with high-level mycology just within still air boxes. The step after a still air box would be getting a flow hood, would be getting a HEPA-filtered station to work in front of. Mm. With the monotubs themselves, are the reasons that certain mushrooms do well in them? Is that just like the structure of the fruiting body that it needs to have like a thin stalk and a cap so it can kind of cover everything as opposed to like the puff balls or the slime molds or things like that, that really wouldn't have any structure to them? Like why do some mushrooms grow better in monotubs than in a different medium? Yeah. So unfortunately, your favorite mushroom, the lion's mane, is 
not the best in a monotub because lion's mane really likes to form in like cracks and really likes a defined growth surface so that it can form that nice pom-pom shape. Otherwise, it, it can sort of work, but it kind of will just bubble up kind of all over the place, very hard to harvest. And so it's not the best. It's those mushrooms with clusters or stems like the chestnut and like piapino and, and even oysters can work well in a monotub. You are going to need to manipulate the holes and the filtration at various times. When you first create a monotub and you're colonizing, if you have holes in your monotub, you're going to need those holes filtered and blocked off. You want minimal airflow because the mycelium doesn't need a lot and you want minimal moisture loss. And then it's once you go into fruiting, then you can remove filtration and you have a good amount of airflow. You're keeping moisture in. You've got your container kind of throughout the whole process. And too often people over-engineer their monotubs and it's beautiful as a passive system. Gotcha. I love that. Yeah. Low maintenance. This was so interesting. Billy, what are you thinking? What do you want to try? Well, I mean, I have to admit my own inherent bias because I really do want to see those puff balls. The lion's mane? Yeah, 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 like the little pom-pom shape kind of. They're so cast. cute. I just, I'm very excited. But I'm also, I want to learn a little bit more about Namaco mushrooms because I've never heard of them until this conversation. I'm really excited to, to dive into those. And honestly, I think that anything that we do, I'm always torn between the culinary and the functionality, right? But it sounds like I don't need to be as torn as I've been in the past because some of these mushrooms happen to have some functionality to them on top of being delicious. So I'm honestly, I'm kind of open to all of it in a way that I never really thought I would be. We're going to have a lot of mushrooms in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. I mean, really, they all have subtle differences in texture and flavor and different compounds present in them. And they are all fantastic for you. People ask me, which ones are the medicinal mushrooms or whatever? Which ones are the functional mushrooms? I mean, they all are. There are natural statins found in oysters. And forget, put all the vitamins and minerals and beta-glucans. They've all got all of that. There have been studies on a lot of these outside of the ones you hear about most, like lion's mane and reishi. So they're really all great to be consuming. And Namaco, we did a monotub with Namaco very recently. And we offer two substrates. We have a wood-based substrate, a sterilized wood-based substrate called the Wood Lover. And then we have one called the Boomer Bag. And the Boomer Bag is a manure-based substrate. And what we did for Namaco was we combined the two. And I really think that's a golden combination there for a lot of things. It worked fantastic. And we, to keep things cold during fruiting, because that's what Namaco likes, we literally put it in the fridge at North Sport because... Namaco likes it that cold. And we had a beautiful crop of Namaco from that. And they are related to the chestnut. It's Foliota Namaco is the name. And they're more commonly eaten in Japan. That's a, a Japanese name. And they have sort of a slimy cap. They're really good for soups and kind of add that thickening agent to soups, but can be eaten however. What about enoki mushrooms? Enoki. I have this relationship with an enoki right now. I'll tell you what, I have been pushing for like a year to get North Spore to carry Enoki. And it's just, I don't know, not the biggest priority right now, but I ho am hoping that we will do it. We have Enoki cultures in our culture bank. And Enoki is a wonderful mushroom. You've probably seen it grown in its long white form in bottle culture is how that's produced in bottles in much larger production, but it grows wild on the in the northeast and it looks very different when it does when it's cultivated it looks different it's more of a golden color than white and it can be grown out of blocks in a very similar way it really can and so if you have advanced your technique to the point that you can create your own grain your own bags you could buy a culture from us and then go from there and still create your own production bags that might then go in your martha you would just have to start a step back. Enoki might, I've eaten a lot of Enoki we mushrooms. Love Inoki. It's a really it's nice so substitute for, well, yeah, if you, if you cook it really, but it's also a great substitute for like things like pastas and stuff like that, where you can string it up and kind of weave it through really nice. Oh man, my mouth is watering now. There's really no stopping all the different options. Yeah, yeah. No, it's true. The 
I always like to mention the scientific names here, and that's Flamulina or Flamulina velatipes. And it really is one that people can forage for. And the cultivation is very similar in a lot of ways because it is a hardwood saprophyte. It eats that dead woody material. So the monotub allows you to dive, kind of weaving back to that, allows you to dive much deeper into some of these, you know, mycological concepts and skills. But once you understand those skills and once you understand the principles at play, a monotub doesn't have to be a 72 quart tub. It can be a shoebox. It can be jars. It's not different. The same things are happening. It can be all sorts of different containers. And you can adapt that in so many creative ways. I love it. Oh my it. goodness. Every old peanut butter jar and jam <laughs> jar. I, <laughs> all our mason jars. We have a <laughs> wide variety of mason jars in our kitchen. Okay. This has been this is awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Louis. We this is awesome. are about to up level our mushroom farming situation in our kitchen. I already know where we're going to put the Martha tent. I love that this conversation you walked us through. Listen, if you guys want to hobble together, you know, if you've got your Martha tent already, whatever, that's great. But North Spore makes it really easy <laughs> to just order something and have it all arrive at your door and have it be sterile and have it be proven to work. So do you want to just tell everybody a little bit about North Spore? We've got a coupon code growing joy that I think gets 10% off. But tell us a little bit more about North Spore and what you offer there. North Spore has been around since 2014, and we aim to be your one-stop shop for mushrooms. And if you're in the area, you know, if you're around Maine, come join us for one of the events that we run. We are really quickly becoming one of the main sources for mycological education on the web. And so hunt around, check out the Learn tab, and send us an email at info at northspore.com if you have any questions. And if you do decide to grab something, use that code growing joy. Yeah, I can't recommend those kits enough as gifts, like the gift that I was oh, supposed to give gifts. at the White Elephant and then stole for <laughs> myself. But they're really beautifully designed, so they're really pretty as a gift. And I think what I did is I ordered the kit, and then I ordered like a package of dried mushrooms that you also offered. So I made it like a cute little mushroom-themed gift. But they're really easy. And just watching, like I feel like, I mean, it's why I love growing your own food. But because you watch a tomato go from a seed to a tomato and you had no idea the process that it takes. It's very similar with these grow kits. I mean, you watch a little pin of a mushroom that's two centimeters turn into a three inch mushroom in the span of a few days. And it's like freaking awesome. It's so yeah. fun. As a general rule, you can have, it's kind of amazing that if a mushroom is in a kind of an ideal environment, especially with oysters, let's say, they can grow, they can double their size each day they begin growing. That's a general kind of rule for what they'll kind of do. And so once they start growing, you know, you're harvesting heart well within a week often. It's amazing. We're obsessed. It's awesome. We're mushroom farmers now. <laughs> That's our whole personality. So <laughs> like any hyperfixation, I assume. Well, Louis, as per usual, this has been such a delight. Thank I'm you so much. I'm excited to get growing this summer. And I can't wait to have you back sometime in the fall for an episode where we'll talk about harvesting more functional stuff, maybe getting into the nitty gritty of preserving, more, preserving drying, yeah. cooking, recipe ideas, all of it. Because yeah. I am prepped already. Billy's going to run lead on that. <laughs> Billy's running lead on that interview, obviously. <laughs> but thank you, Louis. You're the best. And yes, go to northspore.com and use code GrowingJoy at checkout. Lots of fun. I look forward to doing this again. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Louis. Once again, he's the greatest. This was such a fun conversation. Like I said in the beginning, Billy and I did this interview before we headed to Florida for a month to go celebrate my sister's wedding. So we have to kind of have a little meeting when we get back and figure out what method we want to try growing. But man, I love the freaking grow kits. The grow kits are so easy. They're so beautifully designed. And they're, you literally just open them and start spritzing them and mushrooms come. And if you're a mindful plant parent, if you've taken my plant parent personality test, this is an amazing option because you can literally spritz it every day. You can interact with your mushroom grow kits every day while the mushrooms are growing. I can't recommend it enough. If you end up grabbing yourself a kit or anything at North Spore, just use the code GrowingJoy at checkout for 10% off. Welcome again to those new members of the Garden Society app that I mentioned. If you want to come join us in the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. 
I hope you're listening to this podcast as you're tending to your houseplants or tending to your gardens and maybe just cultivating your inner garden, right? Enjoying whatever inner season that you're in. But until next time, my sweet plant friends, I hope you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. 
This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 